of the nation. Almighty God, when you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word, and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first reading today is in Genesis. And in this preceding this, uh, God had said, I'm just fed up with this world. It's nothing but a bunch of sinners. I'm going to totally destroy it. Totally destroy it. But thank goodness there was Noah. And so we now have had the flood, and they're back on land, <clears throat> and uh, God is going to come to Noah with the first covenant. And sometimes we forget this is the first covenant. We think of Abraham and later on Isaac, but this is the very first covenant that God comes to us. And so I'll be with the New International Version. It'll be Genesis 9, 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, and all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds. It will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy our life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God says to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant. I have established it between me and all life on earth. We go to our Peter chapter reading, 1 Peter. He's going to make reference to the flood. You know, the, the old the Jews knew the Old Testament well, and the New, Trust, uh, and the new uh, Christians also knew it well. And so we're reading in 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22. For Christ died for sins once for all, and the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the curates in prison who disobeyed a long time ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. And only a few people, eight in all, in it were only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. May God bless us the hearing and the understanding of this holy word. Have you ever had a piece of equipment that just, you got some mad at? And you had a gun, you wanted to shoot it? <laughs> that long arm won't start. I mean, you nursed it and everything else, right gas, new spark plug, it won't go. This computer I got a good buy on, it shows why I got a good buy. I'm ready to throw it out. And then it rains. And then it rains, <clears throat> then it rains when you're just ready to do something. Man, you're in the construction business, you're ready to put that footer in, and it comes down the foot. 
Have you ever had a relationship going bad? Someone you worked with and prayed for, and you just uh, had it. In fact, you were thinking ungodly fact, thoughts of that person. I have a colleague that I worked with once that when he, somebody he did not like had something bad happen to him, he'd say, couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. <laughs> <laughs> we have that in us. <coughs> well, you know, in the history of mankind, preceding the verses today, God had had it with his people. And we read in Genesis 6, 5 through 8, he decided, I'm going to destroy my creation. He says, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become, that every inclination of the thoughts of the heart were only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I am created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and burst the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Thank God for Noah, we wouldn't be here. We would like to forget about this preceding passage because it ruins our image of God as loving, you know, this grandfather image we have of him. But it also shows us we can experience the mercy as God continues to purify and change us and give us second chances. We see, after the flood, the history of the Bible, God always has a remnant. There's always a remnant. And brothers and sisters, sometimes we as a church are beginning to feel like a remnant in witness to the world that we have around here. We've got to do that. And he does come back to us. He kindling through Jesus, he gives us chances, second chances, and continuous chances as we go along. And then today in Genesis, then, we see the recording of the very first, the very first covenant that we sometimes don't remember. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm going to make for you. There's going to be clouds, but in these clouds, I'm going to set a rainbow. And every time I see that rainbow, I'm going to remember that covenant. And I promise I will not flood the entire earth. He didn't say wouldn't be floods. I'm not going to flood the entire earth and destroy it again. And God never breaks his promise. And this covenant we hear about it all the time, it's a very uh, a short definition, a very solemn agreement, binding between two parties. In ancient times, covenants were common. So the, old, uh, the ancient people were used to covenant. No one would have known what a covenant was at that time. And there are sometimes they're between equal partners, will make agreements and covenants. Sometimes one is sort of higher than the other, and they still make a covenant. Sometimes when a king battled and they conquered a king, still the king and the defeated king made a covenant at that time. But this covenant is not broke the mold. This is not a covenant like any other covenant, it is that God made no stipulations. Covenants, some of you may have covenants on your land, right? Things you're allowed to do. God made no covenants with this. He wishes a relationship with us, and he wants to be known. He wants us to know him and how much he loves us. And we often forget about this covenant because I always think of Abraham and the covenant of Abraham and then renew with Isaac along the way. So seeing after God was ready, really annoyed, destroyed the whole earth, and then he came back. Gives me a little relief. And, 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 and I'm amazed at his love. Because I think we continue to do things that get him a little unhappy. You know, I do. <clears throat> but this covenant has been reaffirmed through Abraham. The rainbow means that God's involved with us intimately. And the whole earth. He created the world. He sent the flood. He made a covenant with people. And he says, I'm not going to flood you again. And God blesses people with promises. And those promises, he never breaks a promise absolutely never breaks it. The rainbow, this beautiful symbol of rainbow. I asked my grandkids, they don't have any rainbows around. We used to get little things you put on your windows or something like that. I wanted to have something visually to pull it out here, but the rainbow is a symbol. Not only we see a rainbow, it's hope. It's forgiveness. God is ever present. God brings back life. God our Father keeps his promises even though we don't. 
friend of the story by Professor Migulor, he was working with inner city kids in Trenton, New Jersey. And one day he told the story of Noah to some of the children. He asked, now, boys and girls, where do you see rainbows? And they replied, in the streets. The professor thought he misunderstood the question. They thought that they had misunderstood that question, but uh, they had not. They said, where do you see the streets? He says, well, we see them in the streets. You see, these kids are in high-rise apartments, you know, and the only rainbows that are seen are where gas and oil have leaked from cars or in puddles, and that shimmering shine you see of a rainbow in that kind of thing. And here we have, this may be a sad story, but it's truly it's a story of hope and grace. For these children, God's sign of mercy and hope was right in the middle of a rather hopeless world. God's promise of mercy was right where it was needed, in the greasy puddles of their everyday lives, and in the greasy puddle of our everyday lives. And this is what God's mercy finds us. Now, when I was writing this sermon, I was also reading the book by Warren Worsby called Be Hope. Uh, Warren Worsby has a Be Hope, a Be Something, the B series, every sometimes cynical classes use it. I don't know how many he has, but about every book of the Bible, Be Something, and so this was Be Hopeful. And he talked about, in that book, the story of Noah, and his faith and obedience actually becomes a ministry, the Noah's becomes a ministry to future generations. And in Peter's day, Noah was held in high regard because the Jewish people in the Christian's day knew the old stories. And if you look at the Psalms, the Psalms refer to Noah often, and we're going to see that Peter, Peter referred to this. And Peter, Noah was a preacher of righteousness, a very difficult time in history when hardly anyone was thinking about God. Noah walked with God and preached God's truth and was laughed at in most of the society. Now let's think back to that. Everybody's doing their own thing and no, there's no rules. This is, you see, we, haven't even, we don't get the Ten Commandments and stuff way later <laughs> in the history of that. And he comes to Noah and says, okay, you've got to build this ark. I'm going to tell you how big it is. And uh, there's no Lowe's, no Home Depot. <laughs> you know? And it's going to take a while cut down that many trees and what you got to work with. And he did it. You talk about faith. I think sometimes we miss appreciating and everyone's laughing at him. We're sitting back, you know, having a good time and laughing at him. This is a silly, silly guy. It probably took him a long time to build something like that. I mean, some people give some estimates of time and I'm aware that is biblically. But anyway, so Peter in our lectionary reading, in our reading today was writing to Christians who also were being laughed at. The early Christians were being laughed at at this time. And Noah was a man of faith doing the will of God when he seemed to be failures in, in part of society. And the message would help us encourage us because Peter, his message to the gospel is, look what Noah did. You might be persecuted too and laughed at, but you can keep on doing it. And you may find yourself in a work social work social, or even your family feeling like you're crying in the wilderness, that nobody seems to have the, the same psychological set that you have. And the actions and attitudes of people that you're dealing with don't just feel right. And, and you can be encouraged by Peter and by Noah that what you're doing is right. But Peter, in our reading, also draws another connection to us with, with Noah and the flood. Uh, he said in our reading today, Christ died for your sins once and all, for the righteous and the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Christ was put to death on the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also we went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. Man, i got to look that thing up. You know, that's a sermon right there. You know, you're saying, he's saying, Jesus went back and to those people that were sitting around the time of the flood, he preached them. I, 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 anybody have a sermon on that one? Yet? I hate to go on a side like this, but man, that's something for Joel to work on. <laughs> he would have the experience to do that. Okay. And then it, in, in it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And the water symbolizes baptism and now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from your body, the pledge of a good conscience toward God, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Peter, pulling back to what Noah did, 
And he sees the flood as a picture of Christ's experience and our experience of baptism. Christ, remember, was like us. He had to be baptized. He had to be anointed before he did his work. After that, he goes on the wilderness. But he gets baptized first. <coughs> and then he starts doing this thing. He's human. He's human like us. He sees the flood as a picture of our, our Lord's death, you know, burial, and resurrection in that. And the sex on our baptism, we were washed from the water, how do we just survive, but we actually are, are die to our sins and are raised to full life in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit at that time. Now look at this imagery here. The waters of the flood buried the earth in judgment, but they're all under judgment. But what? In the ark, they were lifted up. In the ark, they were lifted above and continued, and they become a remnant. And were saved by God. And they learned to trust God and to follow God in this difficult situation. Let's just say a rainbow. One time, my wife and I were fortunate enough to go to Hawaii. And a boy who was a good friend of my son's uh, was in the Navy there. And they came out the airport. And uh, this was just for a while. We had a fairly long layover. And it was a rainbow. And he said, well, here in Hawaii, we see rainbows multiple times during the day. I hope that does it too. Uh, too much of the August. Don't we appreciate a rainbow? I mean, don't we want to stop? Occasionally we get a 180 degree one, you know, or sometimes we get a double rainbow in those things, and, and it just symbolizes for us, this is the covenant of God. The next time we see it, it's the covenant of God. Every time I see that rainbow. And then Peter in our scripture today says, talking about what Jesus done for, did for us. You know, see, Jesus died for our sins, we accept him, we're going to have eternal life, and he's there to work with us throughout this life and what we're supposed to be doing. 1 Peter 3, 18, for, for Christ died for our sins once and for all. He who was without sin, fully righteous, died for you and me to bring on righteous. He did everything right and died for us. When we see the cup of the rainbow, the loving God, he extends, he shows his grace by giving his only son. And it just keeps coming after us. So there are some people that I am praying with in their walk with Christ. So they've seen the drift of the way. And I know God is going to come and bring them back into his fold. And we have this in families, many families now. Children have, have gone away and they don't go to church anymore. They love the church. And so we just keep praying for that. Furthermore, Peter uh, says that, emphasizes Christ's complete victory over angels, authorities, and powers. And so we're saved by the resurrection of Jesus Christ has gone to heaven, as God at right hands, and with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. I think, let's just suppose we could have a picture, I think we're going to die of what we actually see, and they're saying we're certainly going to see Christ. I mean, the, the Jewish people wouldn't even say the name God, you know, but anyway, we picture Jesus at the right hand. And he's there to judge and intervene for us. You know? And so I think it's good to, to, to capitalize on that. And right now, just, just let's just close our eyes and think of an issue you have right now you want to bring to Jesus. Just bring it to him right now. turn out the way we think, but he is working on that, and he is with us in that, and that should give us power and energy to go on with what we are doing. We just have to let him rule. As we let Jesus rule and follow his still, small voice, things will work out, and not the way. Or Warren Wearsby, in talking about Peter's message, said to us that there's three applications to our lives. One, Christians must expect opposition. Secondly, Christians must serve God by faith and not necessarily trust what's logical. And the third thing, we can be encouraged because we're identified with Christ's victory. Well, let's look at these. Christians must expect, expect some opposition. George Washington Carver, an African-American researcher in growing the use of penis, used to caution his students and friends against hate, retaliation, and violence. 
Yet he had an opportunity to put that lesson to practice himself in a very difficult situation. So we're going to go back to January 1921. Uh, George Washington Carver was invited to Washington, D.C. to speak about the possibilities of the peanut as a commercial product at the request of the United Peanut Association of America. Before the House Ways and Means Committee, Carver expected high-level committee to handle his business with dignity and decorum. He was shocked then when he watched the speakers before him harassed and treated in a demeaning manner. Well, that's 1921. This week we've said the same thing, haven't we? <laughs> when his own name was called and he made his way to the front, he heard one of the committee members whisper to him, I suppose if you had plenty of peanuts and watermelons, you'd be perfectly happy. The hurt, Carver's hurt intensified when he saw another committee member wearing his hat, sitting with his feet propped lazily on the table and smoking a black cigar. This is 1921. When the committee chairman asked the man to, revolve his, to remove his hat, he simply stated, down where I come from, we don't accept any, using the N-word, unfortunately, testimony. At that point, Carver was ready to walk out. I mean, why should I have my dignity, you know, question like that? But he reasoned that God had given this opportunity, so instead, he prayed for grace. Carver was told he had ten minutes. He opened his display case and began talking about the peanut and his findings from many experiments he conducted. So engaging were his disclosures and salt, the insults ceased. And when his lot of time, 10 minutes to the the committee said, hey, they voted united unanimously to extend his time. He ended up talking two hours instead of 10 minutes. And the first one to shake his hand was that southern gentleman who wanted to use the N-word. When confronted with criticism and hatred, it's tempted to fight back with violence of our own. With violence and retaliation, only short circuit our gifts and abilities and ruin our opportunities. So we can try to follow Carver's examples when those situations first pray for grace and steadfastness. Before you go into a situation, you know, I'm a retired professor at JMU. I would pray over my students, and especially when I had a point with one who was one of those ones that was a pain in the zoo. <laughs> and as a prayer came before, I had to leave my door open so colleagues could hear the conversation. It wasn't true when I first came to JMU. As things got politically, doors were no longer shut in faculty offices so other people could hear what's going on. It's a shame that happened, didn't it? So, but Christian, you know, we had that, that ability, the power of prayer, and it all resolved well. I would pray for borderline. I had a colleague joke at me. I said, I pray for borderline cases. I said, God, which way is it supposed to go? And that's how I made decisions with borderline care, on borderline cases. He laughed. Uh, he's missing the boat. Anyway, second, Christians must serve God by faith and don't trust, and, and just don't trust in their own reasoning ability. No to serve God faithfully, following God, and he saved seven other people from the flood, and God honored him, and also Israel. The third point by Wiersbe is we can be encouraged because we are identified with Christ's victory. When we accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, we have the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't leave us. You know? It is there, praying for us, and we don't even know how to pray. Through the Spirit, we can live for Christ, we can share his victory, and... and we're probably not going to see that total victory until we die. And then we will at that time. The opposite of Christ that we face sometimes is small and large and is fueled by Satan. I know us good Presbyterians don't talk much about Satan. I think we need some Baptists in it. It's a reality. <laughs> Wonderful Billy Graham would always say, he said two things. I have one sermon. Basically, God wants to save you. You've got to make a decision we're going to save you. You better do it now. <laughs> Every one of his sermons had that in there. Second, it's the Satan's world. Just the Satan's world that we've got to live in at this time. But Jesus Christ defeated Satan. 
He thought he had them done. I got you killed, locked up, guards, boom. Death is overcome. We shall overcome in death these times. So I'm thinking about this man, our rainbow, what a wonderful symbol to remind us of this covenant. How can we take advantage of it? How can we be sure we're getting the most of this relationship of God that was so mad he's ready to destroy us, but he's ready to come back to us? And I'm reminded as, as parents sometimes have to give a time out. Time out to a child. My brother likes to talk about one of his grandchildren, Sarah, who was younger than Will. And Sarah and Will, two years apart, sometimes, <clears throat> these you have brothers and sisters, do not get along. And Sarah, feisty little gal, great soccer player, really impressive. Wham! Hits Will one day. Immediately goes over to the corner, pulls the chairs up, and puts herself in time out. <laughs> Does that work? Oh, no. <laughs> she knew. God forgive me for what I'm about to do. <laughs> All right. But what do we do in time out? We settle down. We think about our behavior. We maybe see how fortunate we are to be loved by our parents, by God. So what about we as adults taking the time out? 5, 10, 15 minutes. You've got to schedule this. Take a time out and just talk to God in some ways. Maybe if we go back and read Matthew, Mark, and Luke and read the final chapters and appreciate the passion story, what Jesus did and died for our sins. And sit down and say, how have I changed in the last year? How have I how have I grown in my belief in my difficult situations in witnessing the people in some kind of way? Just talk to God and be still. Now, I have two grandchildren in college. One is a senior and one is a freshman. And I was, as college students, both of them I sent a blessing each year. And on the one who was a freshman and then this one now a freshman, I also say to them, you are going to be so busy, I want you to find some place on campus, whether it's under a tree, on a bench, or probably a quiet place in the library. And I want you to sit and do absolutely nothing. I want you to sit there and do nothing. And see what God lays on your heart. Or talk to God. And say, God, I'm really worried about this test coming. Talk to God. Feel his presence. Feel his guidance. And then we get the benefit from what he's been doing with his covenant formed thousands of years ago. Maybe keep a journal of your thoughts. I do that. I've started journaling many times. Actually, I've been fairly consistent in the last two years. You know, in a conversation with God. Can we somehow find a rainbow someplace? Draw one. Find a rainbow. Put it where you can see it each day. Each day you see that rainbow. Maybe buy something you can stick on your window. You see it. And be reminded of this covenant. That this reminded that God made the first move with no stipulations. And even after he destroyed his original creation, he came back and keeps this remnant going and loving us. He's active in our lives. Maya Angelou, the poet, writes about the rainbow and its connection to God. This is specifically about about our, gen about our genesis uh, in her poem here. She says, <clears throat> God put the rainbow in the clouds, not just in the sky. It is wise to realize we already have rainbows in our clouds or we wouldn't be here. If the rainbow is in the clouds, then the worst of times, there is still a possibility of 